Audio Papers presents Section 5 A Folk Notion of Cause A Sample of the Folk Theories When restricting a science to hospitable domains generates cause and effect, just what is it that becomes manifest? We identify a pattern that we label as causal and codify its properties in a folk theory. I have just indicated, however, that there is a considerable fluidity in the content of the folk theory, and that there are many possible theories appropriate to different times, people, and domains. Nonetheless, I do not think that the fitting of causal notions is arbitrary. To illustrate the extent to which this fitting is a systematic activity, in this section I will try to outline one possible folk theory that I think fairly represents one mainstream view of what it is to be causal. In the next section, I will illustrate how it is applied. The folk theory will be based on a relation and seven properties that may be attributed to it. I am fairly confident that most causal theorists would not want to endorse all of the properties at once. For this reason, the account below really describes a class of folk theories, with the different members of the class arising with different choices of properties. Choosing different subsets of properties, in effect, gives a different folk theory, more amenable to different domains and different views of causation. My goal is to be distinguished from that of the accounts of causation that are standard fare in the philosophy literature. Their goal is the one true account of causation that is sufficiently robust to evade the existing repertoire of ingenious counterexamples and the new ones that critics may devise to harass it. My purpose is more modest. I am not trying to enunciate a fundamental principle that must have a definite and unambiguous character. I merely seek to give a compendium of the sorts of things at least some of us look for when we identify a process as causal, without presuming that the compendium is recoverable from a deeper principled account of the nature of causation. No doubt, the account I offer could be elaborated, but I think little would be gained from the elaboration because of the imprecision inherent in our current notions of causation. That imprecision supports a multiplicity of distinct theories of causation in the literature, and I have nothing to add to their efforts at capturing the true essence of causation. In giving folk theories of causation this fragile character, I am being a little more pessimistic about the solidity of a folk theory of causation than is evident in the recent philosophical literature on folk psychology, where the notion of a folk theory is most commonly encountered. In the spirit of that literature, Menzies has also sought to characterize causation through what he calls a folk theory of causation. His account is different from mine in that his motivations are not skepticism, and his postulates differ from those given below, depending essentially on a probabilistic notion of causation. For comparison, his folk theory is based on three quote-unquote crucial platitudes. Quote, the causal relation is a relation holding between distinct events. The causal relation is an intrinsic relation between events. Aside from cases involving preemption and overdetermination, one event causes another event just when the two events are distinct and the first event increases the chance of the second event. Unquote. The basic notion. It has long been recognized that human action is the prototype of cause and effect. At its simplest, we identify processes as causal if they are sufficiently analogous. That is, I do not mean to offer an account of the nature of causation in terms of human action. I am merely making the weaker point that, in a rough and ready way, we identify causal processes by their analogy to human action. I do not wish to say that anything in this identification is constitutive of causation. We push over a pile of stones and they fall. Our action causes the effect of the toppling. We build a tower that is too weak and gravity pulls it down. The action of gravity causes the effect of the fall. Using human action as a prototype, we identify terms in the cause and effect relation whenever we have one that brings about or produces the other, and we identify the process of production as the causal process. A popular explication relates causation to manipulability. 
when a cause brings about the effect we can manipulate the effect through the cause but not vice versa this falls short of a fully satisfactory definition since the notion of manipulation contains residual anthropomorphism and produces is little more than a synonym for quote unquote causes however i do not think it is possible to supply a non-circular definition and in practice that does not seem to matter since as i shall indicate in a moment we are able to apply the notion without one applying the notion it is done as follows we restrict a science to some hospitable domain we recover certain processes that are still fully described in the vocabulary of the full science for example an acid corrodes holes in a metal foil we then compare the restricted science to the folk theory of causation and see if we can set up correspondences between terms in the restricted science and in the folk theory in this case the acid is the agent that produces or brings about the holes so we identify the acid as the cause the holes as the effect and corrosion as the causal process how do we know which terms in the science to associate with the cause and effect there is no general principle in practice however we have little trouble identifying when some process in science has the relevant productive character that warrants the association forces cause the effect of acceleration or heat causes the effect of thermal expansion or temperature differences cause the motion of heat by conduction or concentration gradients cause the diffusion of solutes or electric currents cause the effect of heating of a resistor or the cause of a particular electron quantum state produces the effect of a raised probability of a particle detection the terms in the causal relation may be states at a moment of time or entities or properties of entities the blob and arrow diagram the relation of cause and effect is so often represented by a particular diagram that i believe the diagram itself can be an important part of a folk theory of causation it is a diagram in which the cause c and effect e are represented by blobs and the asymmetric causal relation between them by an arrow it is common to represent complicated sets of causal interactions by a correspondingly complicated diagram the particular interpretation of these figures varies by context in the causal modeling literature for example the blobs represent variables that enter into sets of equations usually linear the arrows represent the immediate dependencies encoded within the equations in other cases the blobs might represent the presence or absence of some entity or property and whether the relevant term is present at a blob is determined by some boolean formula generally specified separately from the immediately antecedent blobs properties the blob and arrow diagrams are quite fertile in so far as they suggest properties routinely though not universally presumed for causal relations that can be read either directly from the diagram or from simple manipulations of them a principle of causality all states entities and properties enter at least as an effect and sometimes also as a cause in causal relations each must enter as an effect else we would violate the maxim equivalent to the principle of causality that every effect has a cause we would have an uncaused state entity or property in terms of the blob and arrow diagrams this means there can be no blobs that escape connection with arrows and that a blob and arrow diagram is incomplete if it has any blob that is not pointed to by an arrow that is one that is not an effect the cause brings about the effect by necessity this is expressed in the constancy of causation the same causes always bring about the same effects b asymmetry the causal relation is asymmetric as indicated by the arrowhead causes bring about effects and not vice versa c time precedence the effect cannot precede the cause in time in so far as times are associated with the blobs the arrows point from one blob to another that is contemporaneous or later in time d locality the blobs indicate that at some level of description causes can be localized most commonly they are localized in space and time but they need not be 
For example, in medicine we might identify a particular drug as having some causal effect and portray it as a little blob in a diagram, while the drug is actually spatially distributed throughout the body. The action itself is also presumed local, so that both cause and effect are localized in the same place. If the locality is in space and time, then this requirement prohibits action at a distance. Causes here can produce effects there only if their action is carried by a medium. In his later, far less skeptical treatment of causation, Russell makes this requirement a, quote, postulate of spatiotemporal continuity, unquote. E. Dominant cause. While many entities and properties may enter into the causal process, it is common to identify just one as the dominant cause and the remainder as having a secondary role. This can be represented diagrammatically by chunking, the grouping of blobs into bigger blobs, or the suppression or absorption of intermediate blobs into the connecting arrow. Chunking allows a complicated causal nexus to be reduced to the simple with a single dominant cause. F. First cause. On the model of changes brought about by human action, we expect that every causal process has an initiating first cause. This notion prohibits an infinite causal regress and can be represented by chunking. G. Final cause. In cases in which the end state exercises a controlling influence on the course of a process, the process is governed by a final cause. We are used to explaining away apparent cases of final causation as really produced by efficient initiating causes, so the modern tendency is to think of final causes as derivative and efficient causes as fundamental. Since I hold neither to be fundamental, there is no reason to deny final causes a place in this list. As we shall see in the next section, invoking the notion of a final cause can supply the same sorts of heuristic advantages as efficient causes. I do not know a simple way of representing final causes in a blob and arrow diagram. While all these properties have been invoked often enough to warrant inclusion here, they are by no means universally accepted. For example, asymmetry might well not be accepted by functionalists about causation, that is, those like Russell and Mach who see causation as residing entirely in functional relations on variables. Time precedence would be denied by someone who thinks time travel or backward causation is physically possible, and a growing consensus holds that whether they are possible is a contingent matter to be decided by our science. Locality must be renounced by someone who judges action at a distance theories to be causal. Someone like Mill, who essentially equates causation with determinism, may not want to single out any particular element in the present determining state as dominant. The demand for a first cause would not be felt by someone who harbors no fear of infinite causal regresses. Also, because of their antiquarian feel, I have omitted a number of causal principles that can be found in the literature. Some have been conveniently collected by Russell. Quote, cause and effect must more or less resemble each other. Cause is analogous to volition, since there must be an intelligible nexus between cause and effect. A cause cannot operate when it has ceased to exist, because what has ceased to exist is nothing. Unquote. Finally, I do not expect that all the properties will be applied in each case. One may well be disinclined to seek first causes in a domain in which final causes are evident. And conversely, invoking a first cause may lead us to eschew final causes. In choosing the appropriate subsets of properties, we can generate a variant form of the folk theory specifically adapted to the domain at hand. This concludes Section 5 of Causation as Folk Science by John D. Norton. Please stay tuned for Section 6.